My name's Jackie Long. I'm one of the presenters of Channel 4 News. I always feel at this stage I should apologise for not being one of the more famous presenters of Channel 4 News. So I'm sorry for not being Jon Snow or Krishnan. Um, we'll be talking about Bross later on. I'm sort of the little brown-haired fella whose name no one can ever remember. But in the interest of diversity, I am a woman and I am quite old. So, um, and that um, is enough about me a phrase that stabs the heart of anyone who's on screen. Um, just to give you an idea of how this session is going to run, we've got about 75 minutes. We're going to start with Patrick about BBC Two, then change over to talk to Cassian about four. We're going to reflect back on the triumphs, of course, we're in television, so we're going to talk about the triumphs and the challenges for the year ahead, by which we mean problems and difficulties, but we're never allowed to call them that. Uh, we're going to have some time for questions as we go along. So if you want to submit them, it will be through the app, which is apparently the way that we're going to have to interview our new prime minister these days, if we want to talk to him at all, with hello style questions. How do you keep your hair so nice? Um, we're hoping for trickier questions from you lot. It is your chance to actually um, put questions to these lovely people. So, before um, we start, and what can possibly go wrong, Patrick? I which think is, you're going to ask me about my hair. And which is it's so nice. what we always say at two minutes to seven on Channel 4 News, and broadly what the answer is quite a lot. Uh, before that, we want to have a quick look back at some of the highlights. Uh, Patrick, all appraisals start with the phrase, you've had a very good year, and you have had a very good year. Is the channel where you want it to be? I mean, I think that there's an extraordinary range of content there and that that sense of new shows like Race Across the World, like Your Home Made Perfect, that there's been, it's terrific to see the impact of those pieces. And then with shows like uh, Top Gear, the reinvention of Top Gear or the re-energization of Top Gear and, the, um, and Sewing Bee coming back so strong. So I feel like there's been a really pleasing coming together of old faves being rebooted and new shows that feel like they're the new flavours and tone of the channel. And there's always that bit in the appraisal, well, there is in mine anywhere, where you've had a very good year, but audience share shrunk by 3%. Well, actually, so our audience share on uh, BBC Two, in terms of uh, peak time share for all audiences for 16 to 34s for BAME were the only channel that have increased our, cha our, our share over the year. For, if you go from July to July, so you know, just take it since the last Edinburgh, then our peak share audience for all audiences is up um, a point. Our peak share audience for young audiences is up two points. Our peak share audience for BAME audiences is up five points. And your report July 9, 2019 says your audience share has shrunk by 3%. That is a problem, isn't it? The chat, well, I mean, the numbers that I just gave you aren't made up. They're the numbers that our um, audience folk gave me this, you know, this week. So we have had some real successes in peak in terms of those key areas of the audience. So the challenge is um, it's not all about audience numbers in the overnights. You know, we can talk about that. The challenges in terms of young audiences, the challenges in terms of diverse audiences, the challenges in terms of the fragmentation of the TV audience in general are many and myriad. And I think that we've got lots of really good responses to that. I also think there are challenges to that. So. I mean, you talk about the challenges, you mentioned younger audience. I mean, the BBC as, as a whole, Ofcom says, is facing an existential crisis because of its failure to reach younger audiences. It says that British television, particularly the BBC, has to change if it's to successfully compete. Are you changing enough? So BBC Two, is a broad mainstream channel. It's not primarily solely focused on younger audiences. Its remit, its, 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 um, its role in the BBC portfolio is to be that challenger brand, to be that unorthodox um, uh, a brand that is different from the mainstream and yet is still a big broad mainstream channel. So the evolution of two as a place where younger audiences will come, will see their own lives, will be entertained and excited by the content on the channel, is happening across pieces like Race Across the World, across pieces like uh, Top Gear. But the average age of your audience is still 62. The average age of all terrestrial viewers, that the, of all terrestrial channels, is, is older. But if you look... 62. If you look at... <laughs> If you look at the way in which younger audiences watch television, that 
say, take something like The Misadventures of Ramesh. That series is something that is, you know, it gets a healthy overnight when it plays on a Sunday. It consolidates at about 30, 40% more than the overnight. And then with the iPlayer numbers, then suddenly you're over 2 million. You've got to show that as those different sections of the audience come to it, it gets younger and younger. So younger audiences come to our content by watching it in different ways from the ter from terrestrial... Just really briefly, because we have got so much to get through. I mean, can you still say, as you said, um, I think last year, BBC Two is an essential part of the modern broadcasting landscape. Give me a reason of why it's essential. Because of what I just said to you in terms of that there is the mainstream and then there is this voice outside of the mainstream. And if you look at the tone and the variety of voices that are in that clip reel there, where you have the comedic, um, essential comedic, topical um, uh, comedy of pieces like Frankie Boyle, that where you have new um, factual entertainment shows, you've got documentaries like Forensics, which was you know 2.5 million, over 10% share young, so that you have essential storytelling, brilliant voices, um, and you know some of the best comedic, some of the best dramatic talents in the country. So I think that two is a unique voice. I also think that in a world of endless content, that channel brands are extraordinarily powerful and that channel brands in terms of being places, ways of curating content are increasingly important. And I think that that is what we will see in the next evolution of, um, of, of the BBC is as we're moving more towards an iPlayer first world, the channel brands within that iPlayer first world will be increasingly we'll important. We'll talk a little bit more about brands um, before the end, I hope. But this time last year, your big call out to the producers in the audience were to bring you big ideas, yeah. ideas of scales, a scale. Did they deliver for you? And what were the successes and the failures, dare I call them that? <laughs> so I've said before that it's really hard. I've sat you know, on the other side of the fence. It's not fence, but I've, I've sat there and heard um, call outs for ideas. If you as a producer don't see ideas like that, on the channel, on the channel you're pitching to, it's very, very hard for you to pitch ideas. So an idea, pitch ideas of scale if there aren't ideas of scale already on the channel. So we were starting from scratch with the call out for Race Across the World, which was the show that eventually ended up as Race Across the World, because we wanted ideas of real scale. We wanted the um, producers to come to us and say, that you know, maybe there isn't something which is going to cost this amount of money and be filmed across this amount of days and, and take a factual entertainment show across, literally across the world in the way that that did. That, we gave it a real focus in terms, so, so there were ideas that came to us, David Brindley and Kate Phillips both, in, so two different genres working together to try and find the best ideas, the ideas that were as big as possible and that challenged us to think, okay, so are we up for backing these ideas in the way that we said we were? And um, we gave it a real focus, and I think that by giving it that focus and saying to producers, okay, the ideas need to be in by this point, and then we um, put development money between the, uh, with the ones that we really um, were excited by, and then we had a cutoff point in terms of when we were going to, um, to commission it. So the ideas were really exciting and, really, um, and did challenge us, and hopefully we did come good on that. Um, and as I say, it had real impact for us, Race Across the World. We've recommissioned it for not one, but two more series. Um, and so I was, you know, I could not be more delighted by its, t I mean, also in terms of its tone, in terms of its sense of purpose, there's lots of talk at the moment about factual entertainment and, you know, constructs and should we be putting people through um, particularly, you know, stressful situations. Race Across the World is a skills-based challenge show, which is very stressful, but it's also hugely filled with purpose. So you all did very well with your very ideas. Well. We're going to watch a short clip now of The Claim. So The Claim also came um, it's from 2-4 at the time when we were developer, had this big call out for, for big factual entertainment. It came through Claire Sillery and the Docs team. Um, and it has this audacious premise, which is that there are a, a couple who live in Alaska and they have decided that they want to try and find people who will take over their life's work.
I should just, a big caveat that that is very, very rough. So it's rough, it's very it's, it's good of 2-4 to let us bring it out the edit at the stage that it's at, but I'm very excited by it. That programme, Chef's Brigade and Race Around the World, which yeah. we're obviously very, very proud of, all received top-up funding from third uh, parties, an acceptance that you just can't afford to make these sort of programmes on your own anymore? Well, it's interesting that, so I used the expression about sort of deficit finance in an um, interview, and I, th I think it's slightly been sort of blown out of proportion. In this, it's not the case that those pieces are massively deficit financed in a way that shows 10, 15 years weren't. It's always been the case that shows of scale have attracted finance to them. That I used that phrase as a call out to people to say, don't let your understanding of what a BBC budget looks like be something that stops you coming to us with ideas of scale, because there are ways of making shows. And that's not to say that any of those pieces have got, as I say, huge amounts of deficit financing in them. But there are elements that definitely help, and there are definite de elements that, um, that mean that we've been able to get to that scale. But it's not the case that we just couldn't have done it on our own. It's not the case. I mean, Ofcom say that third-party funding uh, enables the BBC to broadcast content it wouldn't otherwise be able to make. That is more the case in, in scripted, it's definitely the case. That there's certainly, there's, um, I mean, there's an, a, a series that we are announcing today, Industry, um, which is a co-production that we're doing with HBO with um, Linda um, uh, Dunham. And that as the creative, um, on the, the, the creative director of it. Um, and that is something that is very much a co-pro between um, two broadcasters. I mean, Ofcom are worried about the third party funding insofar as they say it's uncertain as a model that the BBC will be able to rely on it because, of course, all these organisations, you know, HBO, Netflix, want to make their own content now. They do, but w people also want to see their shows on BBC and the BBC is an extraordinary co uh, creative partner that... Um, independent producers bringing their ideas to us. They're very, very keen that their shows are on the BBC, the BBC platform in terms of the reach that we can give in terms of that badge of quality. You know, if you make your series on BBC, your series is on BBC Two, that badge of quality that says this is the best, this is the curation of the best um, um, content that is there in all of those genres, that it, that is something that people want to work, you know, pe people want to see their shows on the BBC. And we, it's not that we are uh, wholly reliant on this money. We can achieve this scale, but what we have to do is use license fee payers' money in a very smart way, where what we're doing is building partnerships and, and, and making the best shows for telly. Um, after making your changes to Fact Dent last year, you know, the, the, the big call out this year is about features. And I'm just wondering, how do the people in this audience even begin to pitch to a channel which, in your words, you know, you want to be contemporary and bold and diverse? And as, as I say, yet the average age of the audience is 62. I mean, how do they navigate that in terms of coming to you with ideas for features, say? So if you look at the channel this year and you look at Your Homemade Perfect, which is an eight o'clock show which uses VR technology as a way of looking into um, home transformation shows. I think it's the best home transformation show for a long time on telly. It's got a completely um, young uh, vibe to it. Angela Scanlon is fantastic as the presenter of it. And yet at the same time, it appeals to all audiences. So I think the to my point earlier that producers wanting to see content on the channel that I think, ah, oh, I could make, you know, but I get that tone. I understand what that tone is. Inside the factory, you know, lots and lots of people try and make um, imitations of Inside the Factory for other channels and they fail because Inside the Factory has got that unique um, tone and that unique sense of mischief purpose that makes it BBC Two. Um, and again, young audiences, older audiences come to it. So there's you know, broadcasting brings people together. It can really bring people together. And if you're looking at an eight o'clock show and wondering what the tonality is, then those two pieces are, you know, a very good place to start. Also, remarkable places to eat with Fred Syriax. That that there are that you can bring in audiences, young and old, if you have that spirit and if you have that uh, mischievous tone, but also that BBC Two ground. And yeah, across the board, the BBC is losing young audiences. It's, it's losing young audiences in, in areas of the, of the schedule. But as I said earlier, BBC Two, if you take it from July to July, 
So forget about the Winter Olympics, which slightly skewed the numbers the year before that was in the Ofcom report, in the um, annual report. Then we've grown our young audience. We've grown our young audience on BBC Two because of all of the pieces that I'm talking about. So you're not worried? I'm, of course I'm worried. I'm worried in the sense that, not, I'm not worried in the sense that I think that we don't have the answers. Has broadcast television got an issue with young audiences? Of course it has. But one of the answers but to BBC that- But BBC Two particularly, you know, it's always been a channel directed out or greeted by, if you like, older people, older, posher people. No, it hasn't. I, I, 62, ABCs. But the whole of broadcast television is, has got older, posher people watching television. The BBC Two has not always been something which has only been focusing at older, posher people. That, as I've been saying for the last few years, BBC Two has got that unorthodox DNA. That's where it came from in the 90, you know, in the or 50 years ago. But if you look at the BBC Two that I grew up with in the 80s and 90s, then it was filled with pieces like The Fast Show, pieces like um, Our Friends in the North. I think that with pieces like Riz Ahmed's Inglistan and with pieces like um, Frankie Boyle's New World Order, that we have got that spirit, that tone back. And we should say we've got nothing against old posh people. Some of my best friends are old posh people. Um, let's move on to docs. Last year on this stage, you spoke about um, surgeons and hospital. And this yeah. year, you've launched successes to those brands with forensics and school. Yeah. Now, forensics is returning. School, I take it, is not. School, no, school isn't. I mean, it was brilliant. I thought school was amazing. And in terms of engaging with what's really happening in British education and telling those stories from the point of view of the teachers as well as the pupils, especially the teachers. I think the response from the teaching profession to that series was no one has told stories from the classroom in the way that this series tells those stories and engages with the real challenges that schools face in terms of pupil retention, in terms of funding, in terms of um, uh, parents taking their kids elsewhere. And that, that, I think, had an extraordinary impact. But in terms of, is that something that needs to come back because it, um, is, it, it is, there's another set of stories to tell? I think it told all of those stories with real power, um, but uh, there's no plans to bring it back. And what is coming up, do you think, that you hope will sort of tap into the national agenda as hospitals did? So, I mean, forensics, as you, as you said, had a real impact with the audience and that sense of uh, how that BBC Two real close attention to rather than just following a police investigation, that what you do is that you only see it from the point of view of the forensic science team. And so then you get to understand that step by step um, uh, un unraveling of a, of a case and that complete, um, you know, singular, fo that singular focus to say, this is the only way we're going to tell the story. So forensics is coming back. And I was very um, pleased with the impact that that series had. The series that we're announcing today is inside the parole board. So that's very hard one access. That is access that, you know, parole board has had some quite challenging um, headlines over the last few years. But that sense of who do we let out of prison? What lives are going to change as a result of these people being um, let out of prison. I think that that promises, you know, in terms of it's really hard one access, but also I think it's a great filmmaking team that are going to be able to explore all those stories. And you won the BAFTA for Gun Number Six. So I was very so Louis Theroux winning um, best documentary series and for for um, Altered States and Gun Number Six winning for best single doc. I mean, I think that there was a question that someone asked me about: Is there a because of the returning series and because of you know series of scale, does that mean that these single single films are they going to get um, pushed out of the schedule? And that's just not the case at all. I mean, Gun Number Six was a terrific piece of work. The uh, there was a clip in the in the um, in the tr in the in the um, reel at the beginning that was from Arthur Carey's uh, 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 War in the Blood, which tells the story of two cancer patients who are going through sort of last ditch therapy, but the therapy is also at the cutting edge of global medical science. And it told that story with equal weight to both sides. And often the medical story can be sort of 
just you know turned into the sort of the specialist factual stuff, and then there's the human story which is next to it, and they, the way in which Arthur humanised both sides of that story, I thought it was absolutely remarkable. So, single documentaries like that, single documentaries like the clip. Of which clip are we going to show uh, now? Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein. So, Ur so Ursula McFarlane's film that was um, made through, well, commissioned through Tom McDonald and um, Simon Young in Specialist Factual. Contemporary history, why, <laughs> why an important part of your slate? So I think it's really contemporary history. So the, in, with uh, what the Weinstein film that Ursula's made, with the um, Dangerous Dynasties that 72 Films made last year, with Thatcher, which I was extraordinarily pleased with its impact and the way in which the quality of those films across five episodes um, played out and that the audience um, responded each week. And I've never seen so many reviews from across the um, the, the different, the range of papers, the Guardian reviewing it each week, the Telegraph reviewing it each week, the time. So it was a remarkable response to that series and I thought it was, um, it was fantastic. Those pieces in terms of where we are in the world, how did we get to where we are, are such important questions because we feel like that we're on, in such uncertain times. So the recent past is a really, really important place to go looking in terms of answers, you know, trying to find some answers to those questions. So I think that the Weinstein film, the Thatcher series, um, and, the, and Dangerous Dynasties all play into those really important questions about where are we now in terms of our values and where, crucially, where are we going? Um, and the uh, Rise of the Nazis, which I was going to show a clip of, because of that, that asking that question, it's got the same form or it's the same um, dramatic structure as the Elizabeth Spies from a number of a few years ago that we commissioned, which looks at the unfolding history but through a first-person narrative, and it's in the present tense from the late thirties, uh, sorry, late twenties to the um, to the mid thirties. That, those crucial years when Hitler went from being the outsider and the joke to being the chancellor that was on the verge of World War II and, and committing genocide. It's a fantastic series that just sets, you know, the sort of hairs on the back of your neck up because it just feels so contemporary and yet at the same time, it is a really important um, piece of history. Uh, Louis Threw, you've mentioned him a number yeah. of times for good reason. Altered States, Love Without Limits was the top show for those 16 to 34 year olds that everyone's after on two this year. Um, I think it's been overtaken by Top Gear now. Oh. Top Gear broke the million mark for 16 to 34s. Um, good. Um, the Night in Question was also just in the saying, top five. Just saying. just saying. Just saying, as the kids would say, and won the British Academy Award for Best Factual Series. I mean, you've done well to hang on to him, haven't you? That <laughs> those peaky blinders at the BBC, haven't, BBC One, haven't stolen him from you. But something interesting, I think, and this won't stand the test of a YouGov survey, but three out of my five kids yeah. who are not known for watching anything vaguely factual, apart yeah. from the quiz on Love Island, they watch all of Louis Theroux and yeah. I hear them talking about it. They don't, because I polled them just before I left, associate him with BBC Two, yeah. find it online. Yeah. So you put all that work into it. It's one so, of the big stars. So I think- And you're not getting any of the credit, not in my house anyway. So, <laughs> so um, I am not surprised. I think that if you ask that question of a, a broad or a very broad audience, then there would be a range of answers to it that there are some people who really understand channel attribution and that channel, you know, where is a piece of content from? Where's its home? Where did I watch it? Is a question that people ask um, and that older audiences might ask. It's our job to try and build that channel attribution. All of the new branding on BBC Two is about trying to uh, embrace those diverse eclectic tones that are on the channel and bring them together and say this is your channel um, and that is greater as a result of that work there's been a greater set of people who understand that the content that they'll find on iPlayer is BBC Two content because it's 
it what you know it works in a in a in a in a overall way it's not st it doesn't it's not a failure if an individual watches a show and thinks oh it's a bbc2 a bbc show but i don't think it's a bbc2 show it's great if they do but the most important thing is that attribution to the bbc is key yeah. but also it's the very honorable of you no We're but all the, one bbc no well the most important thing is that we all face is that in a world of endless content is that attribution to that original service is something that you know audiences struggle with because they will find content on lots of you know on Peaky Blinders is on Netflix as well as the BBC and so it's essential that people see Peaky Blinders again and again and again on and in iPlayer, and that's one of the reasons why Twelve Months is such an important part of our discussion with with Indies, because the more the longer that, that that content can stay on iPlayer, the longer that the audience can can associate it with the BBC. And you talk about we all talk about Peaky Blinders, obviously moved to BBC One um, series like Killing Eve and Years and Years, doing really well um, with mainstream drama. Where's your next? Peaky Blinders, have you found it yet? So Peaky's is a, an extraordinary piece that grew on two and it had that very, very, that unique tone that made it feel so, um, well, unique. The, you don't find a Peaky Blinders overnight. There's an amazing series that we've got that Joe Barton's written for us called Giri Haji, which is, a, follows a it's a sort of reverse lost in translation where a murder that's been committed, a gang, a gang murder that's been committed in London um, by the, in the Japanese underworld, by the members of the Japanese underworld, um, is investigated by a returning detective who um, so brings us from, with outsider an outsider gaze into the um, world of crime in London today. And I think it's an extraordinarily exciting piece. And we have a clip, which is always good. So a question that's come in on the app from Anonymous. Um, drama on BBC One is edgier than it once was. So how do you make drama on BBC Two distinctive? Well, it's very true. And, and be, the tone of drama on BBC Two, I would argue, has changed the, um, or helped change the tone of the audience's expectation and, you know, four broader tones across the, the piece. So with Line of Duty and Peaky Blinders moving to, to one, that, the, that that sort of really dark tone has gone into the you know mainstream mainstream so the 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 challenge is that i mean there are pieces of scale that feel like they've got sat they really push in terms of the content and in terms of the themes that those um series go into so mother father son Tom rob, rob smith's series in terms of its tone and in terms of the places it took you in terms of a very primal um, world of the relationships between mother, father and son, um, but in that very heightened um, place that Tom took us to. I mean, that series, to my point earlier about audiences, that it didn't look in overnights like it was doing anything spectacular. It was about a million viewers. In terms of its consolidation, it consolidated over two. In terms of how people watched it over 28 days, it was 2.7 million an episode. So audiences are watching drama and, and, and comedy in particular in really different ways. And that audience, which was an older audience in overnights, got bigger and bigger and bigger and younger and younger and younger. So there's, in terms of, oh, we'll answer the drama question. So, the, the, um, you so, so you either go by scale and tone, so Mother, Father, Son and Giri Haji, or there are pieces that have got a real specific um, focus and a really... Um, that, that people can move much quicker than drama would normally move. So Salisbury, which we announced earlier this year, is a factual drama that is based on the Salisbury, tells the story of the Salisbury poisonings. Um, and it tells it with, it tells that, you know, horrific story, but from within the community and with access to the families. And so that feels like, a, you know, a piece of drama on two that is, uniquely too in terms of the big global issues that it's dealing with and yet it's got that very local tonality but it has to have reach as well doesn't it absolutely but then if you look at there was a clip earlier of doing money that um gwyneth hughes um, made for us last year or wrote for us last year which was about the um uh, slavery in in the sex industry 
And that had extraordinary reach. I mean, that had extraordinary reach for young, diverse audiences. And it was a really powerful piece about a, a difficult subject. And I, was, I just thought that that had great impact. Very quickly, before we move on to documentaries, uh, I mean, Pose came in at hun under half a million in the overnights. Um, we, I mean, you're disappointed. What did it tell you? What does it tell producers looking to pitch ideas? I think that I've, I'm ex I think no other channel would have put a piece as distinctive as that right in the middle of the schedule. So and you weren't disappointed? Not at all. Absolutely I mean, I didn't look at Pose and think, wow, that's going to, you know, that is going to be a ratings, you know, runaway rating success. It's not everything is done for the overnight numbers, not everything is done for the, you know, the impact doesn't only come from the number of people so that watch something. So what did it do for you in terms of... I think that it, what it, in terms of, well, two things, I think that it, that, that growing perception of BBC Two as being a place where the boldest, strongest flavours are found is is why Pose works. It builds also on, we bring the best of the world in terms of acquisition. So pieces like um, uh, Versace, the, you know, the assassination, and also the forthcoming um, uh, the, the um, impeachment American crime story that we have announced today. So we will bring the best of global drama to the BBC Two audience, but also with Pose, it continues, it's got an extended window on iPlayer. You can go there, anyone who missed it, you can go there still and watch it because we've been able to extend the rights for Pose. And so that is crucial for the audience. I mean, you've been talking throughout about a lot of programmes that tackled a lot of uh, tough issues and, and complex um, issues. Do docs on BBC Two have to be dark and difficult? They don't, I can see where you're going here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, they don't at all. Um, the, um, they don't have to be dark and difficult. They are often very dark and difficult. And it's because they embrace, you know, the challenges that everyone... You want to be in the heart of people's lives as they overcome challenges that are, uh, you know, uh, have got a universal um, uh, message to all of us that where we feel that sense of familiarity and yet that sense of, oh, my God, I'm glad it's not me. But there's a series that we've commissioned... Um, which is about the experience of what it's like to bring home your bring home a baby, and it's less about the when it was first pitched to us. You know, one born every minute was on Channel Four as a terrific series that was about the delivery suite. This is a series which is about the cataclysmic <laughs> change that happens when to a family, not just the not just the the, the person who's had the baby and her partner, but also to that wider family. Um, we're going to move really quickly through this, but um, representation was a big theme of last year's yep. Edinburgh McTaggart. We're going to hear from Dorothy Byrne later today in her McTaggart speech, An Old Lady Speaks. God, there are old ladies everywhere these days. Um, there's still a long way to go for diversity ac across broadcasting. Um, you're not the only ones to, to blame. You know, on uh, BBC, on screen diversity monitoring BBC One and Two, men outnumber women on screen by some way, and older women no self-interest, I promise, just drop off screen, quite alarmingly. The, well, the, um, I would say that well, Miriam's recent series shows that, and we've recommissioned Miriam to do it. I mean, her series about death, I thought, was and about dying and the culture of, the way that cultures around the world um, approach death and dying was a remarkable piece of television. Mary Beard, his is now um, ensconced on late review in terms of that is, you know, the show in terms of that as a weekly appointment for cult culture vultures. Mary's series about uh, uh, the nude. I saw her the other week and she was being filmed as she was being painted nude um, for exploring that sense of the, the way that culture responds to nakedness and the male gaze in particular. So there are, I think on BBC Two, that there is a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic place for women to, to, to do their best work as across the, um, the genres. Mary Beard is hugely fantastic, but there is a tendency in the BBC when asked about older women to say, well, we've got Mary a bit. Well, there's also new, there are newer faces for the channel. So there was the British Asian season last year. Yasmin Khan may, was, is, a, is an Oxford professor who is you know, very, very well known within her own field. 
and it was her first big series that she did on um, for the BBC. It's the first series that she did for television. Um, and she is now going to be presenting a major series that we've got about the HS2 dig, so the biggest archaeological um, dig in the, in the country ever. Um, and Alice Roberts and Yasmin are going to be the, the presenters of that. So, yes, there are very established talents like Sandy Tosvig, like um, Mary Beard, but there are also new presenters coming through like Yasmin um, Khan, but also younger presenters like... Um, Angela Scanlon, Maureen Begg, who was a contributor in Muslims Like Us, and she um, made a brilliant film for the Asian se series about uh, called Lost Boys, about the problems that um, some Asian men have within their communities. And she is coming back with a, I can't announce the series, but there's a series that she's um, going to be pre uh, co-presenting and a, um, a single film that she's But it she's remains making. a challenge that you are determined to tackle. Well, it's an ongoing, you know, we're commissioning all the time and we are having these conversations all the time about who are the fake, fa I mean, if you look at the faces of the channel now and you look at um, Nish Kumar, you look at Nadia, you look at Ramesh, you look at David Olashoga, they are the faces of the channel. They are the people who are on the channel week in, week, at, week out. And that is a very different channel from five years ago. We have a couple of questions from the audience, if you don't mind. More Top Gear, more Dragon's Den, more QI, and yet another Ramesh vehicle. Are these really viewer favourites, or is there just a lack of new ideas? We've had, loads, we've had loads of new ideas. Um, and also, if you look at... They are viewer favourites, actually. So the Top Gear audience doubled in this new series. And in terms of... You know, we talk about diversity... Of on screen, there's also the diversity, the diversity of the audience. Who is watching BBC Two? And in terms of the you know diverse audiences, BAME audiences coming to BBC Two are up 11% year on year. So we're doing something right in peak or going in the right direction. Um, and I would say that the new Top Gear is a complete. You know, it's, yes, it's a, a pre-existing format, but watch it. It's a very, very different show. Was it your last throw of the dice on that to get it right? <laughs> I don't think it's the last throw of the dice. It was definitely important that we gave the, the new team some serious thought. Beautifully put. Um, Inside the Factory was on BBC Two four years ago, hardly contemporary, surely. Well, well it's contemporary. I'm not saying it's contemporary in the sense of it's, you know, we've just reinvented it. I'm saying it's contemporary in the sense its tone is contemporary. It's stories that it tells um, feel that they have a... Um, They've got a real pleasure and they have a real, you know, if you, you could do a lot worse than look at Inside the Factory um, in terms of understanding what the tone is that works on the channel at that time. And um, is there a risk you will alienate your older, loyal audience chasing the young audience and trying to steal them from Channel 4? Anon, that wasn't me. So... The aim with the channel, as I say, is that what you do, what you're looking at, is well, a that you've got that commitment to specialism. So the most important thing when we look at with ideas is specialism, specialism, specialism. So it's that that's when you have a series like Planet, that is big, broad, brings in a huge younger audiences, and yet at the same time is loved by older audiences. So. It's, it's having that sense of ambition. You want to do your best, your biggest ideas, but at the same time, you're trying to appeal to the whole audience. Anything that's, we're not a niche channel. We're not just chasing one particular part of the demographic. What do you watch when you get home at night that's not on BBC Two? So, uh, <laughs> um, I really loved Chernobyl on um, Sky. I thought it was terrific. I thought the writing was terrific. The performances were amazing. And um, I was very jealous of that. And in a line, what would you tell these good people here who've come to see you about the next year, what they should be thinking, throwing at you? Ideas-wise, I mean. I think... <laughs> <laughs> I think that we've had real success, and that is down to the fantastic um, ideas that you, know, you and all of the independent and producers and producers from BBC Studios have pitched to us. And so I'd just say keep more of the same, keep, but at the same time, keep pushing us. In terms of documentary, I think we've had fantastic success with um, hospital, with forensics, with, but they're coming back now. We need to keep reinventing. So 
with the, the baby series, which is yet, as yet untitled, that is an attempt to do scale, but in a different way of doing scale. It's not scale of importance of idea, it's scale of, in, scale of ambition of, of how that idea comes together. Um, with factual entertainment, just because Race Across the World is working and Sewing Bee is working, doesn't mean that we, and Claim is hopefully going to work, that doesn't mean that we don't want any more factual entertainment ideas. It's absolutely essential that you keep believing that you can get your best ideas away at the BBC, and BBC Two in particular. That's it, I'm afraid, for you. Patrick Holland, it's off. been a pleasure. Thank you Thank very, you very much. much. Hassan, thanks very much for joining us today. Just a couple of years ago, top flight critics in The Guardian were still writing articles under the headline, what is the point of BBC Four? Mm -hmm. um, this year, Broadcast Digital Channel of the Year, do you think people now know what the point of BBC Four is? Um, I would hope so. I mean, I think that um, it's a little unfair even two years ago for people to be asking that question. I think that um, uh, BBC Four has always had a very clear remit about what it's what it's for and what it's about. And it's about, you know, it's a very distinctive offer, something that's very special, something I'm very proud of, which is, you know, it's a, it's a channel which is about diving deeper than any other British television channel does. It's a channel about culture. It's a channel about arts. It's a channel about music. And it's a channel with a global perspective. Um, um, and I think it's doing incredibly well, testament to the amazing people making programmes for us at the moment, but that's building on a long legacy of my predecessors as um, well. The difficulty looking from outside is that it's always been a channel that's had to fight to justify its place. I mean, is that still true? Um, I don't think so, no. I mean, I think that, um, well, I would say that, in fact, I think all television channels and particularly BBC services need to justify why they're there. You know, we, we're supported by the licence fee, we're supported by our audiences. We need to have a clear purpose and a, and a clear connection with our audiences uh, to justify what we're doing. But I think the BBC Four shows it does that very well. I mean, our audience's share, audience share is as high as it's ever been. Well, the bar ratings that I last saw show an audience share of 1.21%. I think it's more 1.82, I think, if you look I mean, at the peak. Is that an argument for the licence fee or an argument against it? In what way? Well, I mean, do you, does that, is that, you know, the fact that it's a very small audience share, but it's a very eclectic, you, you mm -hmm. would say distinctive mm -hmm. um, channel, therefore justifying the licence fee? Or do people look at that and think, what are we spending public money on this? For? Um, I would say that in terms of its expenditure and in terms of other channels and other digital channels, it's the most popular factual channel, dig factual digital channel in the UK. And in terms of the spend and the budget we have, it's considerably lower than some of our competitors in the digital space. And it's also, as, as the numbers that I see, it's at least as cost effective as the main BBC channels. So the audience share it doesn't matter. I think it's its cost effectiveness and its distinctiveness in terms of the BBC portfolio. You know, at the moment we're running 23 proms. Those are not broadcast anywhere else on British television. Classical performance of the absolute highest international standard. That is something unique, which is what the BBC should be doing and should be doing for the licence uh, repair. So Broadcast reported you've been given a 15% hike in your budget despite the license fee dropping by three percent that, that right? in terms of 15 percent hike that was actually in terms of i mean in terms of how the spend within the bbc and the channel budgets run um it's it's as much a question about how we're accounting for particular spend in that particular year bbc4 uh, actually showed and i think it was a brilliant addition to the mix of the channel um, a lot of sports output uh, we took a lot of Winter Olympics and we continue to do that. We've just done the Women's World Cup. So actually, in terms of accounting for that sports spend, that meant that our budget increased. We also did get an increase in funding in some of our specialist factual content, which led to a series like the Yorkshire Ripper Files, which I think was one of our amazing and sterling successes this year. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone would question that, actually. Storyville's upcoming corruption season and the Bross documentary, mm -hmm. which I absolutely loved, created more memes than Love Island. Um, it feels like BBC Four has had this modernity makeover. It created more memes than Love Island. Where did you get that? That's a good number. <laughs> I need to well, get your source on that one. <laughs> OK, very yeah. good. Um, uh, yeah. You know, are you the trendiest man in television now? Uh, and how did that happen? Uh, <laughs> I leave that to others to judge. Um, uh, no, but I think that... Um, I, I, look, I'm tremendously proud of how the channel's done over the past year, and particularly over the last six months. I think, as I say, pieces like the Yorkshire Ripper Files, pieces like Bross, have shown that... And I think we've been able to evolve collectively and with our suppliers to a channel which um, uh, 
still answers to that original BBC4 brief, which is about deep investigation, which is about culture, which is about arts, which is about music. But we've also, and it talks to what Patrick is saying, because I think it's important for all of television. You know, the issues that you were raising for BBC2 are as relevant in a way for BBC4 as well, which is we need to continue to be relevant to our audiences. Uh, and I think that the Bross film was a brilliant example and a brilliant, you know, journey into uh, a, a world. Music, is a, it was a band bio, but done with a sense of authenticity and a sense of honesty and a sense of openness that made it really surprisingly engaging. If you were being really honest, mm. was that a success almost by accident? Um, I would say that, you know, I think in this business, you know, nobody can guarantee success. Um, I think that what we always have to do when you look at programmes, and it came in, it was an acquisition for us, um, is that you have to go with your gut about what you think might connect with audiences. And to be fair, when we broadcast it, I thought it was an amazing piece of television, but when we broadcast it, its immediate overnight figures were not tremendously high. The amazing thing was the amount of viral pickup that it then got when it was on iPlayer, and then we re -broadcast cast it, BBC Two also did, and it just built and built and built as a, as, as a viral hit. And that's an amazing thing to see and, a, you know, as I say, a brilliant testament to Fullwell and the directors who made it. And you talked about the Yorkshire Ripper files. Mm. I mean, that's a story that's been told so many times. Mm -hmm. Why did that work, do you think? Um, because, again, I think it's about, and I talked about this last year, um, uh, about us wanting to look at different ways of approaching established subjects that, um, that often the BBC can, can take quite a formal approach where it feels almost kind of it needs to be definitive, it needs to be lecturing to the audience. And I think that the transformation, which actually Walter Wall uh, and Leanne Klein in particular had already worked with us on because we've been developing this near history box set idea for a while now, was of turning that story over to a young filmmaker to forge her own journey through the material. Uh, and Lisa Williams, absolutely brilliant filmmaker, but what she did was that she then, she, she comes from that area, she comes from Bradford, she was able to engage herself in this. It, it is an extraordinary story, and you forget just how, um, you know, how, how hellish that period was. But by being enmeshed, in, in, in embedded with her in the same way that there was the authenticity with the Bross documentary. It becomes a piece of television that connects so much more readily with audiences. And a conscious attempt to become more contemporary and specialist factual. We're going to have a look at a clip Absolutely. now. About yeah, you. so this is a series um, on eugenics, which, um, um, I mean, again, specialist factual science is tremendously important to BBC4, but, you know, and we have a tremendously good track record in the history of science. But there's a whole world at the moment, which is the world of gene therapy. Uh, and of being able to alter your own DNA, which actually stretches back into uh, a quite terrifying legacy of eugenics, which ultimately leads to the Nazi death camps. It's a science that was invented in this country. And so we're combining that BBC4 history of science with a contemporary relevance. And this is just a brief clip from it. So, a historical story, but I think everyone can feel the contemporary resonances in there. I mean, a question that we've just had, mm. BBC4 has a documentary coming up called The Harold Shipman File. Surely mm -hmm. that's the Channel 5 commission and not very BBC4. Not at all, because it's, it's absolutely, it's the inheritance of the Yorkshire Ripper Files, and I think that's the really interesting thing which I'm tremendously proud of, which is how we can take a top line or a subject line that feels absolutely that it should be on Channel 5 or it should be on A&E, but take a completely distinctive approach to it that approaches it with respect, with depth, with detail and with unique and singular journalism. And as you know, and as you've commented, the, the critical response to Yorkshire Ripper Files was absolutely this is a subject which we have seen so many times done in a, in a callous kind of sensationalist manner and this series does something completely different with the subject. Because that's clearly the worry, isn't it, that it goes down a sort of true crime, real life, sensationalist... We, 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 you know, we, 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 as I say, relevance to audiences. Audiences are interested in this territory. You know, Patrick's doing his big series on, on forensics. It's about how we approach those subjects and how, particularly for me, we approach them with a BBC4 sensibility. Um, BBC4 more global facing mm -hmm. than um, uh, its terrestrial counterparts. Does that make it better equipped to compete in this really difficult modern world? Um, oh, I'd love to say so, but I no. I think that simply um, 
uh, oddly, BBC Four was there before, oddly, you know, the growth of the, the global drama world that we now live in, of Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. You know, when BBC Four first started showing The Killing or The Bridge, this was completely new. I mean, we still have, though, you know, and I'm tremendously proud of that Saturday Night Zone, which is the very best of international foreign language drama. But actually, I think that the case is more is that audiences, other channels, the rest of the broadcasting, industry has caught up with BBC Four. Um, the, the question for you is a problem that obviously BBC Two struggle with as well, is that, you know, you build these series, they're great, and then they go somewhere else. Where's your next killing? Where's your next bridge? Um, well, we have uh, Below the Surface is just shown. I think that's brilliant. Um, we are slightly dependent on how the international market develops and what it brings to us. Um, but in you need terms to make of, impact, don't you? We do need to make impact, and we do make impact. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the interesting thing for me is looking outside the, con the conventional thriller genre, uh, which does do very well for us. Uh, and we do have, we've done one run of it, and it's returning, and it's rather brilliant. It's a very eclectic French science fiction series called Mission. Uh, which is um, quite fruity in a French way, uh, but also very entertaining. <laughs> no need to lower the tone so I'm early in the day. Relevance um, and diversity of yeah, output. Quite. <laughs> uh, and I think we have a clip coming up of mm. one of your new dramas, is that right? Uh, we do. Well, this, in terms of drama, it should be said that, that this is in terms of acquisition, Saturday night. Um, obviously, uh, you know, and uh, this is a common trope in, 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 the, in, in the industry, it's absolutely true, is that drama, at least in terms of big series, has undergone extraordinary cost inflation. It's an incredibly expensive um, a, 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 a deal these days. Um, what I'm proud of, though, on BBC Four is that we have continued to find ways to do drama at really cost-effective levels. Uh, and I think that, you know, we've done, there was a little element shown in the showreel, Lenny Henry's brilliant so Soon Gone series of shorts, which were monologues, which were about the Windrush, um, eight different stories from the Windrush period. And the thing that I'm really interested in exploring Exploring is drama that's non-naturalistic. The cost and the cost inflation in drama, it comes from television drama's always automatic assumption that it needs to be naturalistic. Finding ways to approach drama and dramatic storytelling that don't necessarily involve absolutely having to be a photo real recreation of X, Y, and Z. So you're saying you just can't do those anymore? No, I don't think we can on BBC Four, but I think also, I often think that um, it, a limitation of funding is a great way of pushing creativity, and I'm tremendously proud of the ways that we found around that. Um, this actually is just a short little taster of uh, Mark Gatiss has been doing for a time, period of time for us now, uh, a cheeky ghost story for us for the winter months, and this is just a taste of his latest one. It is a bit naturalistic, but again, it's very stylized in Mark's way, and this is just a teaser. It hasn't been edited properly yet. So it's a murder trial in which uh, it asks the question, what happens in a murder trial when perhaps the victim isn't actually dead? Anyway, so, it's rather good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that moves us on to mm -hmm. looking at ways of being more inventive, mm -hmm. um, dare I say it, to cost less. But last year you spoke about your upcoming AI night mm -hmm. and the Made by Machine documentary. Is BBC Four still the home of experimentation? And yes. should it be? Yes, absolutely. And again, I think that's um, uh, something I'm tremendously proud of, which is that we have the flexibility and the space to be able to do things and to look at forms of programming that BBC One and Two inevitably can't. But we should also be, and the, I feel that the channel should be, a test bed uh, for other ways and new ways of making television. I mean, the AI night was um, in interesting. I think it was uh, reassuring insofar as I don't think any of us are under threat from being replaced by artificially intelligent schedulers in the near future. Um, but as ways of exploring what are the boundaries of what television could look like and what its shape can be, uh, I think that BBC Four is a brilliant place to do that. Um, you know, we've been doing other, you know, very kind of interesting, you know, eclectic again in the in, from the drama perspective pieces, a brilliant piece called Make, Make Me Up by a, a young artist called uh, uh, Rachel McLean, which is an extraordinary kind of fever dream of um, kind of post Handmaid's Tale feminism that looks completely unlike anything else that you would see on contemporary British television. I mean, I don't want to be rude, which yeah. is what my 10 year old always says before mm -hmm. she's very rude. Mm -hmm. But the reality is niche or innovative or eclectic can be sort of posh TV speak for programmes that people don't really watch. Well, as I say, the share for BBC Four is the highest it's ever been. So 
you know, it is not my job to be uh, making television programmes that are continually pushing to the same audience levels as BBC Two. I mean, we, you know, we can make very successful pieces of programming. Yorkshire Ripper Files, Lucy Worsley's America's Biggest Fit, all a million, and then you add the iPlayer on and we get even bigger numbers. But, you know, we are a portfolio. I have a role to play. Patrick has a role to play. Charlotte's BBC One has its role to play. Um, and my job is to, you know, to make a successful channel which it is, and it meets absolutely the audience. It's not even that I'm set audience targets, but I'd feel uncomfortable if we weren't, you know, growing steadily in terms of what we're doing. We're doing that. Um, it's not my job to end up bumping up against what Patrick is doing. It's my job to do that extremely dis uh, you know, distinctive be balance, BBC4 brief. But there does, and I think we do that, which is it goes from an AI night to Lucy Worsley's America's Biggest Fibs, which does tremendously well in his real populist television. But again, with a BBC4 edge to it. Now, you spoke rather brilliantly last year, I thought, about um, t to producers saying, you know, we've had enough of white men stood on hills telling us how it is. How did that go down for you? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> um, I think that some, some out there decided that they were going to uh, only take a subset of what it was that I was going to say and kind of focused on the fact that I was talking about white middle class men. In fact, my point was not that. My point was not about the nature of the presenters. It was the point was about the grammar of how we make programming, which is, as I was saying at the beginning of, the, uh, uh, of this conversation, you know, w the BBC needs to think beyond uh, an authoritative lecturing mode in its, in its programming. And it's not that we don't also do that. And, um, you know, Richard Clay's programme on memes, of which there was a tiny bit, is a fantastic authored essay from an absolute expert in the subject, and he's also white and male and middle class. Um, but, as I say, Yorkshire Ripper Files or Bross or whichever, those are pieces which have a different mode of approach, which is much more experiential, uh, which is not necessarily born from the expert voice, but the person who has personal connection with it. And I think we we're looking at mixed ecology. That's what I was arguing. Did anyone for. dare bring you a program with a white man on a hill explaining stuff? I, I, um, I, not that I particularly have noticed. I mean, the one thing that we do have, which I should talk about, one, one of the things we're announcing is we're doing, and it goes back to this thing of contemporary relevance and ways to do it, is um, uh, we're just announcing today a big season on fake and fakery, uh, which again is a, it's a BBC4 take on a subject which is hugely relevant at the moment in a world of fake news. So in that particular season, we have a certain gentleman called Ian Hislop presenting a rather brilliant overview of fakery and fake news over the course of the last 120 years or 150 years uh, and Andrew Graham Dixon uh, doing a brilliant investigative journey into this guy called Van Meegeren who was a, a, a Dutch artist who forged paintings for the Nazis and ended up in a very sticky place where he's put on trial at the end of the war desperately trying to convince people that he knew that, 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 that he was deliberately faking the paintings or something like that. Anyway, it's a brilliant piece of their art history detective work. So that's two white middle-aged presenters, but doing some very interesting things and very much that's part of the BBC Four mix. That's white middle-aged men standing on a hill, <laughs> middle-class men standing on a hill. Anyway, um, anyway, I'd love to talk about it more. Uh, we want to talk very some, briefly about one of your women triumphs. women standing on about, a hill as well. <laughs> about... Um, Slow television. Oh yes. And the last igloo. Tell us. Oh yeah. No. Oh, so this is so just in terms of experimentation. I mean, okay. So, so as uh, everyone will know, you know, one of the things from a while back, which I started to push, was 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 thinking about what the form of um, television might be. And one of the kind of enduring successes for BBC Four has been our move into slow television. We don't want to overdo it, as it were. Um, but this is actually an idea which is actually. Post slow, actually, I became, I started to become really, really interested in ASMR videos, uh, which I don't know if anyone knows, but a kind of phenomenon on Tinternet, which are you know, films or pieces of video which are all about the sound. Uh, and the brilliant team at Swan Films came to me with this amazing proposal, which is that they wanted to just film a man making an igloo. Um, uh, simply because it is an ASMR joy. Also because the snow in Greenland, because of global warming, is changing so quickly that actually they may no longer quite soon be the right kind of snow to continue making igloos. Anyway, they've done a beautiful job. It's, um, they've actually recorded it in surround Dolby, some special Dolby sound. So if you watch at home with 5.1, it'll be even more extraordinary. But here's a little moment of igloo making, I think. There you go, a little snow outro just to... Uh... And it is extraordinary. I mean, when it comes on, just listen at home with the sound turned up or headphones. It's just, it's amazing. It seems terrible after a beautiful piece of slow TV to tell you you're going to have to hurry up. But there is one question yeah. from the app. 
uh, very briefly, if you would, any forthcoming seasons and any uh, slots left in fakes season? I'm afraid not. No, it's due to uh, uh, go on here in September. Uh, in terms of upcoming seasons, nothing particularly at the moment, but particularly Patrick and I are always thinking uh, about moments that we can work together as well. We had a brilliant kind of collaboration around the moon landing anniversary, so we will endeavour to communicate those opportunities as and when we can. Uh, to paraphrase the great philosopher Matt Goss, E-N-D, <laughs> three letters that signify the end. It is the end. I'd like to say thank you very, very much to Patrick Holland and Patrick Thank Patrick. you very much. Oh, and thank you to our sponsors, Broadcast Intelligence. Thank you very much.